simply provide a mortgage, okay? And that mortgage is a security interest in the real estate that can be perfected by recording that in some public you know, entity somewhere so the world knows that that, that that security interest exists, okay? So his initial recourse to a default of mine would be to, again, you have to look at the contract, typically would be to the, to the collateral that's been provided, okay? But I can provide recourse to him. And that recourse could come in the way of a guarantee that I could make on a personal level, on a corporate level, or some other entity can provide. I can issue a letter of credit, I could have a corporate guarantor, I could have another personal guarantor. So, so that recourse is additional guarantee over and above the collateral that's being provided to secure debt. In this country, commercial real estate doesn't work that way. Now, if you go to the bank, you're likely going to have to provide recourse. But on an institutional level, the answer is you don't provide it. The only collateral that is available is the asset that's being secured. Okay? And so what it allows you to do, what it allows you to do is to seek debt without providing that guarantee. Now, you asked a very good question. Now, I want to, I want to go to the bank. And I want to show him the value that I have. Yeah, but what you don't want to do is provide that as a guarantee. So what happens is, and so another reporting nightmare, a lot of the developers, the issue that they have is they've got to find a way to show the bank that as the sponsor, not as a guarantor, as a sponsor of a development, they've got the wherewithal to see this through without providing a guarantee. Now obviously, so how do you pull, pull together all of these different ownership interests and stuff? And that becomes another financial, we'll talk about poolings of interest and joint ventures. Let me just go, I can't wait for that one, right? Uh, we'll talk about how you do that, okay? But the reality is, is you don't really want to ever contaminate all of that. You want to use that muscle, but you don't want it to be part of it. And you, you don't want to cross collateralize stuff when you don't need to. Okay, you want to create as many silos as you can. You may not be able to, so sometimes you may need to do that. So what I tell you is I think the basic premise you need to you know, work under is, is that commercial real estate in this country operates on a non-recourse basis. Now, there are exceptions. Construction loans are typically going to have some sort of guarantee. You typically need to have somebody guarantee that because there is an unusual or undue level of risk associated with those. Okay. But when we're talking about stabilized commercial real estate, um, you know, you think, and there's, there's all reasons why why debt, why debt makes so much sense in in uh, in, uh, in 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 this in this world. I, I don't want to jump ahead, but I'm going to show you something which you'll see me through. So this is a balance sheet. This is a San Miguel balance sheet. So the basic accounting formula is this. So uh, accounting is an algebraic, you know, business, you know, function, and, and it's very simple. It says assets equal liabilities plus equity. And looked at in the San Miguel way, assets on the left side, right, which could be debits on the left side, right, equal my credits on the right side, right, which is really just a summation of my liabilities and my equity. Okay? Now, I'm, I'm going to make some use of this in a second. Um, let's take a look at our, our personal situation. I, I today have $20,000 of assets. I have $20,000 of cash, which must imply that I, and I have no debt. So it implies that I have 20 of equity. I buy a house. And I put my $20 of cash as a down payment on the house, and the house costs $200,000. So I now own a house that's worth $200,000. I still have 20 of equity. Using my algebraic equation, what does it imply of how much I had to borrow in order to buy that house? 160? 180. 180. So I get a mortgage of $180, right? That's my liability. I have equity of 20. 
and I have an asset worth 200. Now, the reason I went through all of this is in the context of commercial real estate in this country, how big is how big is commercial real estate in this country? Do we know? Yeah, it's like billions and billions of stars. Do we know how? How big is it? Millions. Millions of dollars. One trillion. One trillion. Ten trillion. One two. Over two hundred billion. Millions of dollars. I don't know how much. Seven trillion. You got one two five. Five trillion. Yeah, I don't know anymore. I, I, no, I, I don't know because what happened is is it, it's very hard to measure that, you know. And, and you've got so you know, you've got what you, no Google. Google. Google doesn't know squat. Google's very dangerous. I mean, Google can be good, but it can also be bad. So, um, when we can you see over here? Yeah. So here I'll put it over here. When we when we. When we talk about the capital stock in, in real estate, we talk about a, something called a real estate quadrant. Okay? And so we basically take the capital stock. So this is a capital, these are assets, and this is a capital stock. So capital is debt or equity. So you can compose the capital that you need to acquire or develop an asset by borrowing money or putting your own resources in. Okay? So when we talk, when we look at this particular box, we talk in real estate something called the real estate quadrant, okay? And basically what we say is we can have public or private. And so we, we, we've got public debt markets and we've got private debt markets. We've got public equity markets and we've got private equity markets. It's kind of very difficult on the private side to really quantify all this stuff, okay? Um, but, I mean, I, the, the last sort of numbers that I had from about, that I would trust from about 2011, um, somewhere between five, you know, four to five trillion dollars. And we've had a fair amount of not only development activity, but value creation. And so, I don't know, if somebody were to tell me that commercial real estate was seven trillion today, or I'm sorry, 10 trillion today, I would believe it, right? But where I'm going, which is really the important thing is, is, is how levered is it? So, so if, if the asset side is 10, how, what percentage is equity and what percentage is debt? We don't know. 65% debt. 65%, where did you get that from? It's a number that I remember seeing. Google? Uh, I'm not sure, yeah. <laughs> Strong enough to say. Truth? I say somebody no, is true or false. 80 20. Who yeah. by 80 20? 80 20? Typical. Okay, we got 80. So I don't know the answer to this either, but I'm going to give you. No, but I'll give you a good, a good rule of thumb. So I can tell you that you are likely going to safely, safely finance a real estate asset to the tune of 70%. Safely. Now, you've got guardrails. Um, um, you know, a very well-performing asset with impeccable sponsorship, with an ownership group that wants to push the envelope, you might easily be able to get 80%, right? Assets that are not as cash flow stable, right, that don't have the same sponsorship, might only get 60%, right? There are specific assets, land. Land, you typically can't get more at most you know, than 50%, okay? So, and then you've also got, that's sign of the times. If you looked at the evolution, I used to have pretty good data from like 2005 on to about here, and then I start, I stopped losing, people stopped accumulating that. But by the time we got to 2007, we were at like 75% debt. And by 2010, we were like at 60. What happened? You know, we had this big blow up, and then the credit markets dried up, and people were saying, "No, no, no, we're not gonna, we're not gonna go through this again." Okay, so you know, they, they, you know, they started, they started lending a little bit less. So, but, but I, I I'd say safely, we've got seventy percent debt, sort of globally, out there, and so if you can borrow seventy percent of the cost of a project and do it without any recourse, it's a great business. So the more you can borrow, the better off you're going to be. And there's, we can't, 
leverage is good and bad, okay? So there is there is bad to leverage, okay? But uh, but it's important. It's an important concept to understand that uh, that we work on a, on a non non recourse basis, okay? Non recourse. Uh, Uh, we don't see these things anymore. Acquisition and develop, acquisition, development, and construction loans. So that we used to be able to go to a bank and get an agreement to borrow land, money for the land, develop, and build. So now we kind of see are just construction loans. Now you might see some land loans, and you definitely see construction loans. You don't really see these packages. These ADCs kind of ended. I mean, you should know all these stuff. I mean, things like air rights. You know, right. Up, up, above, you know, what's real estate? I mean, it's interesting. I, there's a, re, a definition of real estate in this, which is really an accounting perspective, because maybe a land use, you know, attorney might give you a different, but in context of, of an accountant or a financial reporting person, what's real estate? Land and improvements thereon. Land and improvements thereon. What's a lease? In the context of real estate. It's a right to use real estate for a fixed period of time, for a fixed period of time, okay? So, but you know, those are things that, at least in this context, cap rate, we talked about what cap rate was. Here's an interesting one, blind pool. People don't talk about blind pools anymore. Does anybody know what a blind pool is? Yeah, I forgot what it was. I used that, my sister used it on me. I forgot. She used it on you. Yeah, and I told her what told you. So, so it's interesting. I had because people use the term SPAC now, and I don't know if it's SPAC. SPAC is a special purpose acquisition company. So a blind pool was people would go out into the marketplace and say, "Hey, trust me, give me money. I don't know what I'm going to buy yet. Just give me the money, and then I'll go buy it after I have it." Uh, so it's 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 a way of raising money in a real estate realm. So people don't use that term terminology that much anymore. But when you invest in a fund. In a way, it's kind of a blind pool. Most of the time, you're trusting a manager, right? It's got a track record. And you know, Blackstone is raising $25 billion for fund right now. You don't know what they're gonna buy with it. You just know what they've done. So they're saying like, okay, I'll give you a billion dollars because I know that you guys are really good, okay? So in that sense, all fund investing tends to be uh, blind in that sense. CAM is a word we use a lot, CAM. Cam, I mean, it could be a short, a, a, a diminutive for Cameron, but it, it could also be management. Common area. Maintenance. Well, no, common area maintenance costs. When we talk about so, so typically, so uh, there are, there are. We'll talk more about this. I, I there's so much that we could teach in this program that we don't teach. And it isn't in a book. I probably should. I'm not going to do a book. Too much work. I probably would lose. It. When we have leases, what kind of leases do we have? Triple net lease. Or? Gross. So we could have gross leases or net leases. Well, we could say triple net or double net, or we could say, or we could say full service. We could say net of electric or net of janitorial or net of. But we typically have gross and net leases. What does that mean? Who who is you? Okay. Let's talk about lessor and lessee. Who is the lessor? The guy that owns it. Who's the lessee? The, who the guy who you who has the right to use. Does it work like that with mortgage? By the way, the mortgageor is who? The mortgageor is the guy who who, 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 who owes who owes the money. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the mortgagee is well, you say the bank, the, the lender. It's kind of backwards there. Okay, so so. In a gross lease or a net, tell me what you want to do. Who is you? The gross lease, the the, the, the lessor. Yeah, what did he said. No, the, no. What did he say? What? The lessee or the lessor? Depends. The lessor pays for everything, and then 
Is that, is that bad? Is that, am I giving you bad, bad vibes? Okay, so what I want to argue is, is the tenant always pays all the operating expenses, one way or another. But we've got different ways of paying it. In a gross lease, you pay one sum, the tenant, the less the lessee pays one lump sum rate, right, to the landlord, to the lessor. So I want to pay ten dollars a square foot. Okay? I occupy a thousand I occupy a thousand square feet, so I pay ten thousand dollars. Is that monthly or is that yearly? Yearly. Monthly. Yearly. Monthly. No, that's annual. That's annual. Ten thousand. Well, lump sum is yearly. I check the contract. Okay. Annual. By business practice in this country, in commercial leases, we quote annual rates. We quote annual rates. But be careful because in Europe they're monthly rates. Okay, so you you got it, you got it, you just gotta know where you are. But in this country, that is ten dollars per year, so we pay ten thousand dollars for the year. Okay, so we pay whatever per month. Our our rentals in this country by business practice in advance or in arrears? In advance. In advance. In advance. What's the question? In this country are rents by business practice in advance or in arrears? In advance. In advance. So that means we pay the first of the month for the period we're going to occupy. In this country, by business practice, are mortgage payments in advance or in arrears? In advance. Do we know that for a fact? No, because no, no, no. we're pre Arrears. No, they're in arrears yeah. as a business practice. Okay, now, they could be in advance. You, you could structure it that way. But as a default mode in this country, we typically pay at the end of the month, which means the interest that we paid was for the previous period. And the rent we pay in advance. Okay. And so we're gonna pay, we're gonna pay ten dollars per square foot, and then the landlord has to pay the operating expenses. Let's assume the operating expenses, for argument's sakes, are three dollars a square foot. Okay? Okay. In a net lease, what happens? You pay the landlord what? You pay the lessor what? The tenant pays, the lessee pays the lessor what? Seven. In this case, if it were a perfect world, they would have a net lease that would cost seven dollars a square foot, and then they would have an obligation to reimburse the landlord for the operating expenses, which in this case would be three dollars, right? And you kind of get back to the same spot, okay? So business practice is some markets are gross markets, some markets are, are net market. If you're the landlord, you always want to quote rents as triple net rents. That way, if your estimates of what inflation are, you know, we had an issue some years ago, insurance rates went through the roof. To the extent you got a gross lease, you can't pass through, you know, these absorbent increases, right? Uh, all of a sudden you get a tenant that, you know, consumes a lot of electricity and you have no reason to know, you know, you're kind of, you're kind of stuck with it, right? So if you're, if you're a landlord, you typically would want, you ideally would want to have a net lease and that way you know what you're getting for to service your, you know, your, your capital, right? And your return on capital and operating expenses are paid by the tenant. But by hook and by crook, the tenant always pays the operating expenses a different structure. Now, over and above the operating expenses for your specific space, you pay, a tenant typically is obliged to pay common area maintenance costs, which could be, which could be in the context of a building, lobby, bathrooms, hallways, but it could also be in the context of a large industrial park or a large office park. It could also be roadways, right? landscaping, security, and things like that, okay? And so you typically, a tenant typically pays a pro rata share of the common operating or the common maintenance costs of a structure over and above the space that they occupy, okay? And there's all kinds of, we'll talk a little bit more about that next week because there's, there's important things to know about um, Imminent domain. What is imminent domain? 
when a government entity can, yes. Where the government can possess one's land in the interest for, of the community. For the benefit, state, for the benefit. Well, or, the or the supposed benefit of. So, um, yeah, the, I mean, there's starting to be, and I'm, I'm not an attorney, but there's starting to be situations where you're getting public private partnerships sort of pushing that envelope too. So you're starting to find ways, but. It, um, so it's it's somebody taking your land basically for a greater good. I, I had a boss once that said that the highest and best use of land was the minute domain. <laughs> because now nah, but, but it becomes it becomes a very difficult process because the government is never gonna come in and say, We're gonna take your land and we're gonna give you the, the highest you know price for it. But if you get good attorneys and they really need it, you can typically work out a you know a reasonable uh, you know deal with that. Um, there's uh there are obviously accounting issues associated with that, with the taking of land, but there's also taxation issues uh, related to that. Um, does anybody know what a 1031 exchange is? Mm -hmm. Some of you guys know that. I'm gonna, we'll talk about that, and I'll, I'll, I'll work, work back and bring it to this. What's a section 1031 exchange? Uh, tax, tax deferral. It's a deferral, tax. Yeah. Okay. So uh, it's a deferral of taxes. What does that mean? Experience capital gains. Yeah. Experience a capital gain. What's a capital gain? It's a passive income. Passive income. Dude, you're, you're throwing all these over, things at me. I'm trying to say, uh, you're throwing all these charges. Money. 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 Cap, cap, cap. Investment money. Oh, man. James? Capital gains? Is that uh, income you can make from investment? I like it. Like okay, so, 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 a, a, right. So, so there's, without getting into sort of, um, um, a tax course in the context of individual taxation, not corporate, in the context of individual taxation, the tax code is going to look at income in a variety of different ways, but you can summarize it by saying that you have operating income or capital gain. Okay? Operating income is typically taxed at a statutory tax rate, and ordinary income would come from things like salaries. Okay? Uh, interest that you would earn and things like that. Capital gains would be income that you would earn from acquiring and holding assets for a prolonged period of time. And so the government has historically as an incentive for people to make investments under a longer term provided preferential tax rates for the long term hold of assets. So if you hold assets and the rules have changed and I don't know where we're at but let's say that you would Let's use 12 months as, because I think that it's back at 12 months now, but if you hold an asset for 12 months typically uh, and then sell it, you typically have a preferential tax rate. But that is a, a preferential capital tax gains rate. That has nothing to do directly with Section 1031. So, so if you own real estate and you own it for more than a year and you sell it, you could be subject to paying income tax on an individual level at a preferred rate. We still haven't gotten to what 1031 is. All real estate? It has nothing to do with real estate. It could include real estate, though. It's a like-kind exchange of assets. Yes, Ken? Well, with the 1031, for example, if I own a business, I can use the profit from that business to purchase another business without being taxed twice. I think. No, so, 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 so technically and historically, 1031 exchanges were, were, again, so the governments use tax code to promote certain activity, okay, right, wrong, or indifferent. Uh, you know, you historically were able to deduct, you know, fully your, the interest on a home mortgage to try to support or foment home ownership rates in this country you are able to deduct real estate taxes in their totality to support home ownership, okay? Along those lines, to foment business activity, they said, hey, if I have an asset and I swap it with you, I want to make that subject to certain conditions, not taxable. At the moment. Yeah. So, you know, I own a, a tractor and you own a tractor, okay? 
and you know how to fix tractors and mine's beat up and yours isn't, we just swap them. Now, sometimes there's something called boot that's exchanged, okay? So I swap tractors plus I give you a little bit of money. But the whole concept is that rules were created to say, hey, there really hasn't been a taxable trans event there. Nobody's realized cash. And so what we're going to do is, is we're not going to tax you at the moment. But then the tax code been, you know, um, extended. Now, do like-kind exchanges really exist in real estate? Yeah, I'll tell you, real like-kind exchange. I'm going to swap these buildings for this building. You don't see that a lot, but you do see it. I remember, uh, Avalon Bay, to, to read, public read, UDR, public read, about five or six years ago they swapped $300 million of assets. One was a heavy West Coast company, the other one was a heavy East Coast company, and they basically said, look, you know what, we're just not doing very well on the other side of the country, and they swapped $300 million worth of assets. Boom. So that does happen. Again, nobody's got cash to pay tax on that. So what the government has said is, is that if you meet these conditions, you can do that swap, and all you've got to do is carry over your basis. So the basis that you had and the asset that you had carries over to the one that you acquired. And then when you ultimately sell that, then you pay taxes. Hopefully at a capital gain, capital gains rate at that point. Okay? But the rules have really been sort of expanded and relaxed. And as it relates to real estate, right, it's become a very favorable technique for people to own real estate and hold it for a long-term basis. And to continue to stay, to stay invested in real estate without having a tax burden. Taxation drives a lot of people's decisions, okay? And so what happens is, is if, if, if I owned an office building and by selling it, I would have to give the government 30% of the profit, I might not be motivated to transact. But from a financial perspective, I may have added as much value to that business as I needed. And it's time for me to sell. And so the government has said, hey, look, you know, we're going to relax the rules. And so like kind is not like, okay, an office building for an office building anymore. So really almost any real estate, okay, can be swapped for another real estate. You can't swap slivers. So if I'm a limited partner in a building, I can't sell my limited partnership interest, okay? If I own a share in a REIT, I can't sell the share in that REIT for another share and defer my gain, okay? But if I own an office building, I can buy raw land. I can take the proceeds from that sale and reinvest it, again, subject to conditions, reinvest it and I don't pay tax on that gain. All I do is I carry over my basis to the new asset. And when I eventually sell this, I pay the tax. Now, you can almost do this indefinitely or for long periods of time, okay? And there's a bunch of implications in the real estate market. A lot of you guys have seen, who was doing triple net lease deals? Who was like the guy peddling, dialing for dollars? Didn't one of you guys say you were doing at Marcus and Millichap? Who was doing well, that? I, I did financial analysis. Oh, okay, okay. I thought you were like dialing for dollars. Because that, that's one of the shops that... So, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about triple net lease deals one day. But a lot of times people need to park money somewhere. Because they haven't found the right replacement asset. And these triple net deals are very liquid. Yeah. And they're very good for deferring that. So, but what will happen is, so there's certain conditions that you meet, okay? So, in 1031... Um, you basically have a 180 day window mm -hmm. from when you sell to when you need to close on your replacement property. Okay? So let's use 1231 as a date. You close on 1231, you've got till 630 to close on your replacement. You've got 45 days to identify replacement property. Okay? Mm -hmm. So you've got till the 15th of February to identify. And you can identify, if I remember correctly, three specific properties for 200% the value that you're deferring, okay, with a limitless number of properties, okay, so you don't really need to know, but you better have a pretty damn good idea, okay, and so the money has to go into what's called a qualified interme intermediary, okay, so at closing you can't touch the money, it goes to a qualified intermediary, 
That guy holds it, you identify, and then you've got 135 days now to close. And if you comply with that, basically if your basis was 100 in this building, you may have bought this for 300, okay? But you carry over that basis of 100, okay? So you don't pay any tax at this point. You just keep going with a lower basis, okay? Now, now, there's a bunch of other rules, you know, related to this, and you can do forward, and, uh, but that's basically it. Period lapses, you didn't identify property, you pay the tax. 45 days pass, and you don't identify replacement property, you pay the tax. Nothing happens. There's no penalty. You just don't get the benefit. Now, the reason I brought that up is a long way around it, but this is important because this is very, very, very frequently used in real estate, okay? I was in a deal. We sold. We, sold, we, we bought an industrial building, sold it in six months. Did not have the holding period, Matt. We would have paid ordinary tax rates on it. So now instead of paying the preferential rate, we're paying 38%. Had a nice gain. What did we do? Did a 1031, bought another asset, we're going to hold it for a year, we're going to hold it for a year, and then sell it, and pay a preferential, you know. We've added value as well along the way, and now we're going to sell it at, and, and, and pay a preferential tax rate, okay? I'll get to your question in a second, Brian. So, th the reason I bring all this up too, and I said, so 1033, the government says, hey, if we're going to take your property, we're going to let you do just like a 1031. The one difference is, you now have two years. Mm. So like it's eminent domain. Eminent domain. Yeah. So the government says you have two years in order to do this because you're, you're you're planning to sell. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So say, look, you can put that money away for two years, and you know, we did that once, as a matter of fact, and we wound up just paying the tax. But but you deferred paying the tax for two years. You know, we like we didn't think we were going to replace anything, but you know, hold on to cash as long as you can. That's one of the things in life. Mm -hmm. Brian, you had yeah. a question. If you're, let's say you're doing a 1031 and the deal uh, falters within the 45 days, like within the 45 days, or if you're under contract for uh, example for another building and the deal falls through after 45 days, you already you already on. Well, contract so so time. so what happens is is you've got that's why you're given the opportunity to identify three properties, right? So let's say that you contract one of these three properties. That deal falls through. You could still, if you want to, then go to the next property and close on it. Or within the number limitless number of properties you identified here, you can then just go to the next property. I don't think that usually happens. I think it, it, it is. So it sounds really nice. The problem is, is you really got to identify something before you close. And you, you, you pretty much have to have something almost negotiated. Because there's too much. Because, okay, I closed here. Now, now I'm looking. How much leverage do I have with a seller? Zero. They know, they know that I got hot money. Mm -hmm. and, I, and, and I got the tax gun to my head. <laughs> do you think they're going to negotiate with you? And that really does happen. I mean, I... You know, we'll go one day. We uh, we ultimately wound up. We we, we tried to defeat a loan. And we couldn't. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. We we were trying to assume a loan. We wound up having to defeat it because we. And I'll get to that another day. But we had to close. We couldn't pay the tax. We didn't have the cash to pay the tax. We'd used the cash on something else. So hold on. Yes. Is there a way for them to find out? Is that public record when you file a 1031 or I mean, well, so 1033 is an election. You do that on your tax return, yeah. you, you, that's not, there's no filing. The 1031, there's no public filing, but you do need to use a qualified intermediary, mm -hmm. okay? Um, does that become public knowledge? I, I don't believe that's recorded anywhere. So how did they find out you were... Well, look, the, 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 the onus is always on you to maintain your tax documentation, right? And that's only ever going to be required. So there are times there are certain tax circumstances in which you need to report. Most of the time you don't need to report. You need to keep adequate documentation for a period of time. And at the time of inspection is where you've got to demonstrate all this stuff. I'm saying the person that was, 
originally the landowner that you guys... Like, so you're going back to the 1033. When they found out that you guys were sitting on hot cash, how did you, how did they find out? No, nobody found out. Oh, we okay. just did the, the period lapsed. Yeah. And what happened, listen, the reason we ultimately didn't buy anything is, is we were partners with a deal, in a deal, and a partner did, did, didn't want to reinvest in anything. And so you basically have to come in into the new deal together, right? Yeah. And they were like, you know, we, we're just, we, we, don't, we, want, we want the cash. And so we have, we have to file, right? And at that point, we know the period has lapsed, so we know we got to pay the tax on it. I mean, I think it's nice to to hold the money and defer it, but uh, there could be a downside as well. I mean, because if the tax law change, no, you typically from so so there are risks to holding cash. Namely, you can spend it. Okay, <laughs> cash has a tendency. Listen, money talks and cash screams. It has a tendency to disappear. Okay, but but no, you typically in this country, in this country. Typically in this country, when there are tax changes, you typically have a safe harbor where your grandfathered into whatever treatment, would, would that be right as an attorney? You typically, if there's changes to laws or tax schemes, you typically can, can be in a safe harbor under the rules that were in place at the time that a transaction transpired. That may not be the case in other countries. Okay, but that's one of the things that this you know country is safeguarded. So if the rules change, you should be comfortable that they shouldn't apply to you retroactively. Okay. Now I I don't know if this is correct. I've asked this question before, um, but I saw online that people were trying to do 1031s with a re. They were they were holding they were putting they were. Identifying a property, I guess either that I re-owned, they were parking it in that property for a certain time period, and then the REIT was purchasing it. And I didn't understand it because I thought it, it had to be a light property. So I, I said, let me ask, maybe it's something that you know about. But it was like a, a medium type vehicle that they were using um, to move the money then into a REIT. I, I don't know. Bring your No, so um, so what, what is what is common? What 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 is common as a tax deferral scheme is um, if you own an asset that a REIT buys from you, um, they will issue units in the REIT to you, which are convertible to stock, to shares. And you're typically not taxed until you convert those units to, sh to shares. Oh. So, so, and, and again, that was an advantage. You don't see, it, it, the, the real estate's become so institutionalized now. You don't see REITs buying things that individuals would own, okay? Mm -hmm. But, if, you know, a REIT would have come and said maybe, you know, bought a grocery anchor, you know, center. You know, Kimco would come in and buy a center from somebody that had developed a local developer that had developed a, a public you know anchored uh, shopping center and how would they pay them well we'll give you units in our re it's a, it's a tax deferred transaction for them they don't pay tax until they convert those into a mon into a monetary asset into the shares and now the REIT has the asset they wanted the guy's got favorable treatment okay and to boot He's not diversified his holdings because now he's not just tied to one unit. Now he's tied to the portfolio of the REIT. So that was a technique, but I don't, I, I don't know if that's what you were referring to. I'll, I'll send you the website because I saw it. I'll send it to you. Okay. I, I, by the way, I may not have the answer, but I, okay. I did want to say that. Um, so I, I mean, all this stuff is here. Um, uh, Let's talk about this one because that's the um, mortgages. Mortgages can be what's an IO? Interest only. So you can, when you have a mortgage, you can pay a mortgage. There are multiple ways of paying a mortgage. You know, I, I want to use three that I would use in my mind. So some mortgages have no principal repayment at all, and you pay interest only. 
And I would venture to say that in almost every mortgage in this country, you're going to pay interest somehow. Now, you could have construction loans. We'll talk a little bit more about this. You could have construction loans with interest reserves. And you're not actually funding the interest. You're borrowing from a loan to pay the interest. But, but from a, a um, evaluation perspective, you need to pay interest currently or, or typically a loan is just classified in this country, okay? And it has to be um, um, reserved for somehow. <coughs> so, so you typically are going to pay at a minimum interest only. Now, you may have periods where the interest also accrues. You see that, you saw that in a lot of residential mortgages in 2005, 2006, 2007. You wouldn't pay interest for a period and it would just accrue onto the, so it was kind of like a, a built-in interest preserve or, you know, a, an appreciation. We typically pay interest. Now you can have fully amortizing loans. What's a fully amortizing loan? Decreasing, decreasing your debt. So, to, so you're repaying the principal and the interest so that at the completion of the term, the loan is fully amortized. Yes. Okay, so um, you historically have seen in commercial real estate transactions here a lot of... So when would you see interest-only loans? You would see them a lot of times where you've got transitional assets, assets that, or debt that's only going to be used for a, a fixed period of time. Okay, um, I don't have enough tenants. Uh, I've got to I've got to do some rehab, and I want to have to let go of some tenants, so that you've got minimal cash flow to service. Okay. Fully amortizing loans tend to be used when assets are, let's call them mature and stabilized. Okay, and so you know, commercial real estate probably anywhere from ten. Let's say on the outside you know, to 15 years, you would see a traditional loan, okay? Now, as a hybrid to that, to make the cash flow palatable, you know, you've got these, uh, you know, partially amortizing loans with a bullet payment at maturity, okay? And so, what you might have, for example, is say, a 10-year loan that's amortized as if it were a 25-year term, so that at 10 years, you still have a significant principal component to either pay or what typically people would do there is is refinance. And you typically don't see loans. I would tell you 10 years is probably the maximum that you'd see from my personal ex, you know, experience. You don't typically see loans going out beyond 10 years. Now to facilitate the cash flow, you might have a different amortization period. Okay? And then in year 10, you know, you expect somebody else to take you out, or you take that person out, that, that creditor out, by borrowing money from somebody else. Make sense? Yeah? Okay, so we've got interest only. Uh, lease comm commencement and lease inception, do we know the differences there? One second. One is when it's shorts and one is when it's written or signed. Okay, which one's which? Inception is, when it's signed. Inception is when you you're contractually bound. Okay, and commencement is when the actual term starts. Is there a difference? One happens before the other. They may happen at the same time, but what happens with a lot of commercial deals is space needs to be worked, right? And so there's going to be a different period from when you contractually commit to when the space becomes available. Okay, but but once you, once you've got the inception, now you're committed. Now you've got somebody spending money typically, a landlord a lot of times in this country does a lot of improvements, tenant improvements, to accommodate or to prepare the space for your specific use. Okay? Um, so, yeah, so there is a difference. When are leasing commissions paid? When? Sign. Closing. Some, yeah. Closing. Some, some, Who said closing? Some do like when do we close? We don't close. We lease it. Oh. <laughs> so in sales, it's in closing. Very good. Yeah. Leasing, okay? Good. Okay. So, so how do commercial... 
You were I, I was, yeah, was, was some, sometimes we do like half and half. Like, uh, so I will tell you all the time. Yeah. So commercial leasing commissions are typically paid 50% when? When the tenant actually moves the commencement. Conception, they want, they want their money. The lease is signed, pay me. What is the other 50% taking? Or paid? Move in. Typically a commencement. So what that means is when you're a landlord, you're big risk on a commercial leasing transaction because commissions, so how much are leasing commissions? How much are commercial leasing commissions? Um, it's it's, 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 it's month. Uh, it varies. It varies. It depends. You like six? So it depends. Yeah. It's going to depend on the markets and all that. You could use, um, you could use 6% as a proxy, okay? And, and you might see something like, 3% to the listing agent and 3% to the tenant rep. Uh, you might see 2 and 4. You might see times where you might see 7, okay? Where you might see 3 and 4, okay? So the brokers would have the landlords believe that they control the tenants and they need commissions in order to bring people here. So, you know, it just depends on how weak or soft the market is, okay? I would say sort of, this is kind of the rule of thumb, and you're typically paying, again, depends on the market. You're going to pay on either the gross or the net, depends on, on local practices. But you're going to pay, let's just say, on the gross lease payments over the term of the lease. So if you've got a 10-year lease, you're going to pay 6% over the 10-year cash flow. That's a tremendous amount of cash you've got to have on hand that you've got to pay up front, and if a tenant blows out on you, you're out the money because that's not refundable. Okay. Um, what a lot of what a lot of um, 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 listing agreements will have is they'll have a break period here some other. There'll be this rate, let's say, for the first five years, and then there'll be some sort of discounted rate for the second five. Okay. And then then you've got issues of that you got to negotiate. What happens on a renewal, or what happens on an expansion? Okay. And uh, you know, again, you've got the broker typically looking for protection there, and you've got the landlord saying, hey, I'm the one who's got the relationship now. I shouldn't have to pay. But um, owning real estate uh, requires a tremendous amount of upfront cash. You're paying for TI and leasing commissions and any other concessions that you make up front, and you haven't collected anything from a tenant. So when we talk about credit, when we get to the credit section, and we talk about looking at financial statements and understanding as a, as, a, as, a, as a real estate owner, you're making credit decisions and you're betting money on somebody else paying you cash over time. So you better understand what their financial situation is like before you say, yeah, 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 we'll give you $50 a square foot of TI. Yeah, yeah, we're gonna pay these commissions up front. Yeah, yeah, we're gonna take over your lease on your other building, okay? So, for some of the other ones. Uh, joint ventures, very common in, in, you know, to do ventures in this country, especially you see it in construction companies where you know, you know, maybe maybe a client relationship is with, with a smaller company and you know they, they don't have the bonding capacity, they don't have the technical expertise, they'll bring a big company in. But you see it with developers too, and you see it, forget that that the legal structure is no longer uh, whether it's an LLC or whether it's a general partnership or not, you typically see institutional investors partnering or venturing with local merchant developers in developing things. One brings capital, the other one brings market knowledge. One brings capital, one brings local expertise or brings a deal. One brings financing capacity, the other one brings, you know, uh, you know, local knowledge and executional ability. Okay? So, yep. You know, it's a very capital intensive business and it's very prone to people working, you'll hear this again, people working for slivers of a deal. You rarely see in real estate somebody working on their own. Um, you may see that with some smaller families, they start small, they start growing, but for the most part, eventually you have got a partner because the concentration of capital and the risk that you assume is probably not true. Okay, so uh, um, to this day, 
to this day, my old boss, very wealthy man, did very well. We sold the company a publicly traded business, we sold a publicly traded company on to a private, uh, to a private equity group. Uh, but he still joint ventures all his deals. He still brings institutional partners on every one of his deals. You're saying like a lack of diversification? That's all, for, for diversification purposes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. or, or not concentrating his, his, the risk of capital, right? So, you know, I may have, I may have $100 million, right? I may be, be able to buy this shopping center, you know, or this mall, right? But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put $10 million here Right? And I'm gonna bring another partner to bring in 20 million just to say something, right? And we're gonna borrow 70, okay? So I've only got 30% of this deal. But you know what? Now I can do 10 more deals like this. Yeah. You also build in a, a preferred return too? So so there's a there's a waterfall, yeah. So that's the other reason that you know this particular gentleman, as most other developers, are very astute. They typically, not so much a preferred return, but a carried interest or a promoted stake, okay? And so what's carried interest? Compound interest. Carried interest. The amount of money that's designated as like, uh, that goes, even if it's not paid, it carries over to the next one until it's paid. It carries over until the next one's paid. I'm trying to go simple, but I, I can't explain that. Okay, can't explain. Okay, let's keep trying. Someone? Who's graduating now? This is like this is the way real estate works, okay? That's so high water mark is that a way of describing it? Well, high water mark is like like when the tide comes up, mm -hmm. how far it goes up on the beach, That's isn't so it? Much real estate related. Okay. <laughs> so there. Is this stuff interesting or not? It's yeah. Very interesting. Very interesting. It's captivating. Wow. Mm -hmm. Never heard of captivating before. Okay, let, let, me, let me give you a very basic private equity structure. Private equity, I'm not talking about real estate right now. Because if I go into real estate and I start doing a very complicated waterfall, it'll become, I'll, I'll build to that. In, in, in the private equity world, Carlisle, Blackstone, uh, you know, KKR, Apollo, you know, Leon Black, all those guys, um, the, the traditional private equity model is the following. Uh, the limited partners put in 100% of the equity, and these guys manage that equity for a 2% annual fee. And when the money's distributed, it gets distributed 80 20. So the carried interest is equity that it's recognized that was never funded. So carried interest is having an interest in the distribution of, of, of an investment without having ponied up your pro rata share. Okay? In real estate, we would call this a promoted interest. We're talking about promote. Okay? But it's carried interest. That's a very simple structure. Now, we can make this a little bit more complicated. Okay? So by making it a little bit more complicated and making it a little bit more like real estate, we can say, hey, we're going to add a preferred return to this, okay? And so let's just say in today's realm, we're going to pay these guys a 7% return before we distribute this. So when we do the waterfall at the end of, when we do our final accounting at the end of, you know, the distribution of a deal, okay? What we're going to do is we're going to say, okay, you put in 100, I'm going to pay you 107, and then of whatever's left, I'm going to take 20% and I'm going to give you 80. Make sense? Okay. Now, you can make this a little bit more complicated. You can put some other hurdles or some other benchmarks. Okay. You could say, I'm going to repay the capital that was put up plus a preferred return. Okay. And once we reach that preferred return, now I'm going to split 90-10, up until you now have a 10% IRR. Once you have a 10% IRR, now we're going to re go 80-20, up until you have a 15% return IRR. 
And then we're going to split 70-30 or 60-40. Okay? So, easy to explain, hard to calculate. And I got into a fight with one of these GPs today over this. Okay? Because it's like, okay, here's your money. Yeah, show me a spreadsheet, man. You know, I, 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 I'm an accountant. I mean, I, I got to see it. Okay? Oh, we don't give it to anybody else. Well, but I want it. Okay, so, so, so carried interest or promoted interest is having participation in profits over and above any capital contribution that you may have made. And this is how developers make their money. Because developers have to put typically some money into a deal, but most developers, what developers, what do they love? Fast cars, beautiful women, you know. Yeah, but they spend all, every developer is like, you know, Boats, airplanes, flashy clothes. Have you ever seen a developer that doesn't like dress like, you know, beautiful hair, you know, the trophy wives, you know, uh, the Ferraris? No, I've seen them all. What's the reason for that? I don't know, because they live flashy lives. I don't know. It's because they're selling something. I don't know. I'm not, we got psychology majors here. Ask Alex. <laughs> Ask Alex. I don't know why. I, I know that. I don't know why. Okay? Um, but they don't have a lot of equity to put in the deals. Or in certain cases, some people have done very well, but they continue to say, hey, there's a multiplier effect here. I can make my 10 worth a lot more than that 10 if I put my knowledge and some other's money. And you say, well, why would somebody else give you that money. Well, I'm in all these deals as a limited partner. I don't have a lot of money, but you want, I don't have to deal with all the management. I don't have to deal with the tenant. I don't have to deal with the, you know, with the brokers. I don't have to deal with the closing. I don't have to do the diligence. I'll give you some as long as I'm getting a nice return. Hey, I got a 15% return. This deal that I said I got into an argument with got a 20.2% IRR over two years. I didn't do anything. I got a report every, you know, every quarter. Now, you know, they made money. They made money, but they work for it. And when you look at up uh, at your Prudential or MetLife or teachers, and you're managing all this money, and you're in New York, and all you care about is going to the Hamptons now that it's almost the summer, and getting out of work early on Friday, and martinis, and all that. You don't know anything about like zoning in Palm Beach or wherever you work, you know, or construction in, in, in Miami or, you know, okay, I, I, I'm just managing somebody's money. You know, I'll go down there in the winter and, you know, go to lunch and play golf at the golf course and stuff. And so that's why, you know, the institutional guys will give you the money, but that's what drives real estate. And this is, this is another one of the reasons that developers are in a business. Because there's a multiplier effect to the equity that they can put in deals. You know, they put in five percent, but they might have forty percent of the equ of the equity or the distribution at the end. Yes, me. Real fast, that two percent. What is that? An annual management fee. Okay. So you put in a hundred dollars, and every year you get two dollars to pay the people that are managing your investments. So that's going to the developer. To the, yeah. to the general partner, let's call him. Okay. No, this is a private equity. <coughs> I see. So in the development world. You won't see this. In a development world, what you'll see is is the develop listen in a development world what you'll see is is part of the deal of the joint venture is it is it the 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 equity partner is going to allow the developer or the sponsor to contract his construction company for a fee and his development firm for a fee and his brokerage firm for a fee and they might get a a closing fee, you know, an asset acquisition fee, or a disposition fee, or whatever other kind of fee along the way. Fees. It's all fees. It's all fees. Okay. So look, we're not done, but we got to do a quiz because, believe it or not, we've been sitting down for the last four and a quarter hours. Hope it's been fun. So I'm going to have to make up some questions because we didn't cover half the stuff we were going to cover today. But we're going to have five easy questions. Five easy questions. Five easy questions. 
So if you could put your stuff away, put your notes away. Put your name on the paper. Because then when I grade it, if I don't know who it was, I might be able to figure it out. to do is, for those of you who have an interest, is to highlight the areas where um, there are pressure points that are critical in, in financial reporting for real estate entities. So maybe it's revenue recognition, maybe it's what what is your pool basis of accounting. So it, it, it's very simple, just one page of facts, a little exaggerated, and then, and then it's just going to ask you to do some things in the back. What I would say is, is again, you don't have to do it. You know, it's, it's worth whatever, you know, point or whatever. So you figure out if you want to do it or not. Um, but if you're going to tackle it, try to tackle it, okay? I mean, don't, don't just send me, you know, like a piece of paper around for that. Because it's going to be binary. You, you, this one will be binary. You did it, you did it right, or you didn't do it. Okay, so it's going to be, this one's 100 or 0. So if you're going to do it, put your effort into it, okay? So but it'll, it'll, it'll be easy. It's, it's relatively, it's two pages. Um, the next thing is, is, was the content interesting? Was it, was it, was you guys are good with this kind of stuff? Uh, hopefully what this class can do is, is complement some of the other things that maybe 